Hello there, uh, I'm Ken Robinson and uh, I wanted to start by thanking Steve Moffat and all the staff at A New Direction, firstly for convening this conference and for inviting me to say a few words to it. Uh, it these are issues close to my own heart. I've uh, been really intimately involved with creative and cultural education for as long as I can remember. I started out in the arts uh, and I broadened out a little bit from there in ways I want to describe to you in a minute. Uh, but in the arts I actually start out in drama and theatre and became increasingly interested in the work I did, not just in that discipline but how it connected to all the other arts disciplines. Uh, so I think the work that you're involved in and that New Direction exists to promote and that today is, uh, is celebrating is fundamentally important. It's important to the education of all of our children, it's important to our economy and it's important to the future of not just the country I believe but to our species and I know that sounds like a rather grand claim but I think I can justify it. Um, I, I was involved ten years ago, actually a little over ten years ago now, in a national strategy for creative and cultural education and I wanted to offer a few words of reflection on it because uh, currently as you're meeting and as I'm speaking there's another review going on in the UK of uh, cultural education uh, conducted by uh, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport and Education and it is also looking for priorities and for techniques. Uh, the music report that was published uh, early in the year I thought was very good and I hope the cultural report will be equally good. Uh, there are though some abiding principles and I, I want to point to them uh, and to say why I hope the report that's forthcoming and the work of A New Direction and of the Bridge organisations uh, won't be starting from a blank sheet of paper. I know it won't in the case of, of A New Direction uh, but we'll be building on I think a lot of things that we know already that work and that should be promoted. Uh, about, uh, it was 1997 when uh, uh, Tony Blair was campaigning to, uh, to become Prime Minister, um, he said that he would have three priorities if uh, the Labour government were elected. And he said the priorities would be education, education and education. It's of interest to me that every government that comes in always turns its sights on education. It happened in the previous administration to the Labour government, the Labour government did it, uh, Michael Gove is doing it in this administration for the coalition, it's, it's one of the top agenda items for governments, that they, they seek to improve, reform or sometimes transform education. Um, it always concerns me, again, that governments often seem to start from what they believe to be a blank sheet of paper, that everything else that went before needs somehow to be fundamentally changed. Uh, there were some things that needed to be changed when the Labour government came in, there are some things that need to be changed now. Uh, I'm not myself completely content with some of the changes that are in, in prospect uh, immediately but again I'll comment on those too but let me just give you the historical context. Uh, at least I live in Los Angeles now so 10 years here is a kind of an historical context. The, uh, Tony Blair talked a lot about creativity and the importance of promoting creativity systematically in schools and, and then he presided with others over a series of initiatives in education that seemed to me and to other people to be custom designed to inhibit creativity. Uh, there was a much greater emphasis on certain sorts of standardized testing, uh, there was a pretty narrow remit for Ofsted uh, then and the experience of people who worked in education pretty much was that whatever else these reforms might be doing, promoting creativity wasn't one of them. So uh, I and others approached the government at the time and said, you know, if you're interested in having uh, creativity at the centre of education, we need a strategy for it. You know, we had a literacy strategy, uh, we had a numeracy strategy, and these were deliberate plans that were set out, that were adopted across the country to make these things happen. You know, it wasn't that we all hoped that children would get more literate and we just left some books around and hoped they'd take an interest in them. Uh, there was a plan and I and others said if you're interested in creativity let's have a plan, let's make it work. Well uh, I was invited then to put together a national commission and I did 
and it was called the National Advisory Committee on Creative and Cultural Education and it produced a report called All Our Futures, Creativity, Culture and Education which I know many of you know already but I guess some of you who are uh, more recently involved in the profession may not know quite as well. So I wanted just to rehearse some of the premises of that report and, and to respond to what I was asked to do by A New Direction which is to reflect on where things have got to since then. The premise of all our futures was that creativity should be at the very centre of our educational priorities and uh, at the time creativity was often talked about but was still in my view largely neglected or seen as eccentric. Um, you know one of the centrepieces of the literacy strategy was the literacy hour. So elementary schools uh, were given materials uh, through which they were to teach literacy for an hour regularly using the same protocols and, and ideas to all children. I know from conversations I had at the time with some of the ministers uh, when we were putting together our report that some of them were hoping that we'd be recommending a creativity hour like on a Friday after lunch uh, when it was time to go home and you know, sort of send in the clowns. Uh, because although people talked a lot about creativity, there I think were lots of misconceptions about it. And the report that we produced, All Our Futures, really took a much more uh, comprehensive view of the changes that were needed in education if creativity was to be taken seriously. And predictably, and ministers since then have told me that uh, this was the case, but we felt it was predictable, the government, when the report was published, uh, tried to marginalise it. And the reason was it went much further than they either wanted or expected. But I believe if we were to take creativity and cultural education seriously, we have to go pretty far. It isn't just a question of tacking these things on to the existing way of doing things in schools. We have to look at much more fundamental change. Let me tell you why I think that is. Uh, often politicians of every party and at, at all, in all kinds of departments. We'll talk about getting back to basics. Now, in education, when people talk about getting back to basics, what they often mean, or seem to mean anyway, is uh, getting back to some conception of education that they uh, had experienced when they were younger, uh, or to some supposed golden age of high standards in education, of high academic achievement. And more particularly, they tend to focus on certain areas of the curriculum. So very often when people talk about getting back to basics, what they seem to mean are uh, mathematics, uh, language, you know, reading and writing, and sciences. Uh, this isn't just happening in the UK, by the way. Uh, it's, it was happening here. It's been happening here in the US, where I live now. When uh, President Obama gave the State of the Union address earlier in the year, he talked about the vital importance of promoting innovation and the fundamental roles in doing that of education reform. The trouble is that all he talked about were the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering and math. Well, you know, I'm a pretty tireless advocate for those disciplines in schools, for maths and science. They're really important, of course they are. Who, who could contradict it? But the idea that we can put the world back on its axis purely by promoting the STEM disciplines or that we can promote national prosperity just through the STEM disciplines is just simply wrong. And uh, I don't know any scientists who would claim it, that if, if we just get maths and, st and science higher up the, the food chain, that everything will come right. But you see, it also sends a message to people whose real interests lie somewhere else, in the arts, for example, or the humanities, or physical education. The implication is that if you're not interested in maths, science, and technology, or, or if you're not very good at them, that you can sit this one out. You know, this particular crisis uh, will be solved without your help. You can sit on the bench, and, and when all the mathematicians and scientists have figured out the way forward, we'll call you if we need you. It's, I think, a pretty despairing view. Uh, it's a very narrow view, anyway, and it simply won't work. So, when we talk about getting back to basics, it's very important to me that we don't think of the basics as being a set of disciplines. Uh, we should think of the basics in education as the core purposes of education. And it's in the framework of the core purposes that we can begin to see the importance of creative and cultural education more clearly. I think the focus gets sharper. 
There are three basics, I think, in education. Uh, in no particular order, but I'm leading up to a point, so I'll put them in this way. The first of them is economic. You know, anybody who believes that education does not have basic economic purposes is living in an alternative universe. Of course it does. It's why we pump so much money into education and it's why there's so much debate about it. And it also is true at a personal level. I mean, I've got two kids and uh, I assume if they go through education and do well that they'll be better positioned to get a job and to become economically independent. I can't tell you how much I want my children to be economically independent and as soon as possible. And we all do. But the issue is what type of education do we need these days to meet the needs of the sorts of economies that are now emerging? Well, there was a report published uh, last year uh, here in the States by IBM. And the report was based on a survey of 3,000 CEOs around the world. In every type of business and in not-for-profits, in universities, in the public sector. And they asked all of these CEOs what their main priorities were as CEOs. You know, what were the challenges they face and what are their priorities? And it really came to three. The first was, they said, how do you, this is their challenge, how do you, as a CEO, uh, run organisations in a way that enables them to respond to complexity? The world is becoming, they said, and they're right, increasingly complicated. It's becoming more complicated by population growth. It's becoming more complicated by the uh, interpenetration of information systems everywhere by levels of communication, by travel, um, by mobility. Um, the world has hardly ever been so challenging in many respects from an economic point of view. I mean, there are other respects in which it's more challenging too, but from an economic point of view, that's the case. You know, it's true in our daily experience. I, I came across um, a quotation recently, which I rather liked, um, about what it is to be British these days. I found this on the internet, I'll read it to you. Um, but I live in America, it applies equally well here, but, uh, but you get the feel of it. It said that being British these days means driving home in a German car, stopping to collect some Irish beer or Danish lager, and picking up an Indian curry or a Greek kebab, and spending the evening on Swedish furniture watching American programs on a Japanese TV. And the most British thing of all? Suspicion of anything foreign. Well, you know, it's true wherever you live on the earth, it's becoming more and more connected, more challenging, more difficult to comprehend in lots of respects. So that's the first priority. How do you respond to complexity? The second challenge for the CEOs was how do you run organizations that are adaptable to change? And you've only got to look at the recent history of corporations to see how mortal they are, how quickly and how rapidly many organizations fall over and die, and they simply do. The history of of uh, the corporate world is littered with the corpses of once sturdy and heroic organisations that simply fail to keep pace with change. But the third priority that the CEOs pointed to in the IBM study was creativity. They said, how do you run organisations that systematically promote creativity and innovation? Now, I put it this way around because one of the reasons in the political debate for limiting the school curriculum and for standardizing is to meet what governments perceive to be the interests of the economy. But if you listen to business leaders, if you talk to economists, they'll tell you that the greatest need now is for more innovation, more creativity, uh, greater use of imagination. So if we're serious about getting back to basics economically, creativity should be at the very heart of the debate and we should create conditions in education which promote creativity. And that was a big argument of all our futures. There's a second basic purpose of education, which is cultural. Uh, education isn't just about meeting the needs of the economy. To say there's an economic argument doesn't mean the economic argument is all there is. We also live in a world of other people, of shared values, of very different values, uh, a world of increasing cultural complexity. And so part of the task of education is to 
enable our children to understand the world they live in and the values that other people live by. As I see it, the cultural agenda has these sorts of sub-purposes. One is we want forms of education which enable our kids to understand why they think the way they do, uh, why they feel the way they do, where their values have come from, um, why they live as they do, why they believe the things they do, and why the communities they live in believe the things they do. So part of it is about helping people understand their own cultural origins and identity. But an equal purpose is understanding other people's origins and cultural identities and why they believe and think as they do. And thirdly, to breed a sense of tolerance of all of those things. You know, if you look at the broader challenges we face on Earth, in addition to the economic ones, they're inherently cultural. The more connected the world becomes, the greater our mutual understanding, you might expect, would be. But there's not enough evidence that that's true yet. I mean, we're still, in some ways, fighting out cultural battles and uh, cultural antipathies that have their origins five, six hundred and a thousand years ago. If you look at, we're still living out the great clash of civilizations in some respects. So the cultural agenda has never been more urgent. But there's a third basic in education, and to me it's what it all comes down to. It's personal. What I mean is that education in the end is about individuals and how they themselves perceive the value of their education. It's whether their education engages them, whether it stimulates their imagination. It's about whether it seeks to find their own talents and develop them. It's whether they feel invested in the process. You know, in America just now, there's a dropout rate from public education, according to a recent report by a group called America's Promise. Uh, there's a dropout rate between ninth and 12th grade in public education of about 30%. It's actually much higher in some communities, and it's at a really extraordinary level uh, in the Native American community. It's as high as 80% in some areas. Uh, among black American young men, the dropout rate is often as high as 60%. Well, that's not counting disaffection and disengagement of the people who stay in school and don't really connect to it. And there are similar problems across the UK. And I was recently at a meeting in Los Angeles of alternative educators. I always like these terms, like alternative comedy, but uh, these are people who are running programs uh, of alternative education, which are programs that are designed to get kids back into ed education who've dropped out. Well, interestingly, alternative education programs have certain common features. Uh, one is that they have an individualized curriculum. Uh, the second is they have fairly intensive relationships between the uh, teachers and the students. A third is they feature a lot of group work and collaboration. A fourth is they have a customised curriculum. And a fifth is that they involve close links with the community. Well, you know, to me that's education. And it interests me that it's called alternative education. And I feel that if all of our education systems were like that, then kids wouldn't drop out. You know, they, they would want to be in school, they'd want to be educated. They drop out because education doesn't speak to them. And all the attempts to improve education by making it less personal, by making it impersonal, really are destined to fail. You know, Britain, and England in particular, is often looking uh, across the North Sea to Finland. And I know ministers have been out there to learn the lessons of Finland. Finland has a very broad curriculum. Interestingly, they give an equal place to the arts as to other disciplines. They have little or no standardised testing. And I was at a meeting there recently at, with a group of Finnish educators and people from the States. And one of the American educators said to the people from Finland, you know, what do you do about the dropout rate in Finland? And the spokesman for Finland said, well, we don't have a dropout rate. You know, why would people drop out? They, they like going to school. So these three areas of purpose, the economic, the cultural and the personal, are, are to me fundamental and they're all connected. And the, the challenge couldn't be greater just now and the stakes couldn't be higher. There was a report recently by the International Labour Organization and uh, they came out with a statistic which is worth dwelling on. You know, in, currently in London, youth unemployment uh, has been rising over the past four years. I think it's now at twice the level it was four years ago. Uh, I first uh, got involved in some of these policy debates, particularly in the arts, in the 70s, and 
that's the 1970s, by the way, uh, and the 1980s. And um, I published a report with the Gulbenkian Foundation called The Arts in Schools. And one of the backdrops for that report of the importance of the arts then was the growth of youth unemployment across the country and, and not least in London. Uh, we worked at that time with Claire Short, uh, who went on to be the Overseas Development Minister. This was before she was Claire Short. And she ran an organisation called Youth Aid, and there was a big concern then about youth unemployment. Well, it hasn't gone away. Uh, despite all the investment in education, the problem continues, and it will continue until we get education right. But these are the figures from the International Labour Organisation. Uh, in 2010, across the world, there are 620 million young people. That's people between the ages of 15 and 24. 620 million. Um, in 2009, uh, there were 84 million of them out of work. Uh, that's a 13% unemployment rate among young people, and it's been increasing steadily. Uh, that's 8 million more than the figure in 2007. That's a huge catastrophe in waiting. It's been referred to as a lost generation. When people are at the peak of their energies and aspirations and ambitions, and there's no role for them in the economy or they can't find one, that breeds despair for them and a festering social problem for everybody. So the interconnections of the personal, the economic and the cultural agendas, I think, are the key to the future. And creativity and cultural education are central to meeting those challenges. The trouble is this. There are lots of misconceptions about both creativity and culture. And therefore, I believe, lots of mistakes in the way that people set out to implement them. What we argue in all our futures and what I've been continuing to argue since, is that uh, creativity is often misunderstood. There are three bis big misconceptions about creativity. The first is that only special people are creative. This is not true. Everybody has profound creative capacities. So a strategy for creative education has to involve everybody. The whole school, the whole community, all the teachers, everybody. It's not just for a few, it's for everybody. I'll explain why in just a minute. The second misconception about creativity is it's about special things, like the arts. Well, this conference is about the arts, and it's the arts that we're concerned with today, and I've been focused on the arts for most of my career. But I said earlier that I'd really want to take the argument beyond the arts, and I do, because creativity isn't just about the arts. You can be creative at anything at science, at mathematics, technology, anything that involves human intelligence. So a creative education isn't just about having an arts policy. A creative education is the whole curriculum, everything and everybody. And the third misconception about creativity is there's not much you can do about it, that you're creative or you're not, and that's the end of it. You know, you're born creative or you're not born creative. That's not true either. You can teach people to be creative. You can help them to become more creative. It would be like saying you're either literate or you're not. You know that you're either born to read or you're not. And we know that's not true. We know that when people say they, they are not literate, we don't hear them saying they're incapable. What we hear them saying is they haven't learnt what's involved. And it's the same thing with creativity. When people talk about not being creative, it just means to me they don't know what's involved and they haven't made the effort or they haven't been taught how to improve those particular capacities. So it's about everything, it's everybody and it's the whole curriculum and it's a practical process. The fourth misconception is this, that creativity is some abstract power, that uh, some people are creative just in general and other people aren't at all. The key to this is to define creativity. And so we did that. Uh, I remember one of the ministers uh, at the time, actually, when uh, we were doing all our futures, one of the ministers said, the trouble is you can't define creativity. And I remember saying, no, the trouble is you can't, uh, because you, you haven't thought about it. But because you haven't thought about it doesn't mean nobody's thought about it, and we gave it quite a bit of thought. So this is the definition I would currently use for creativity. The creativity is the process of having original ideas that have value the process of having original ideas that have value. The three key terms are, it's a process, it's not an event. Uh, very often, ideas evolve as you work on them, and the idea you end up with is not the one you started out with, and that's true whether you're working on a mathematical theorem, or you're composing a piece of music, or you're designing a building, or you're doing a piece of ceramics, 
or you're writing a poem, or you're designing an experiment. Uh, the creative process will take you to places you hadn't anticipated. As Elliot Eisner once said of the arts, uh, you could say of creativity, that it's a surprise, not a prediction. It will, the whole point is it will take you to unexpected places if you focus properly on how the process works. Um, the second key term is it's about originality. To be creative is to come up with new ideas, new things. But we argued in all our futures that you have to be careful to recognize that originality can happen at different levels and take different forms. Uh, you, it may just be original to you, it may be original to the group you're working with, it may be original to these children, but it has to at least be new to the person who's doing the work. Uh, some breakthroughs are new to the whole of humanity, but you can't hold that up as a standard for all creative activity. There's no point with a group of five-year-olds you know, who are taking a drawing lesson, uh, taking their, you know, some child's drawing and saying, well, this is okay, but have you seen the roof of the Sistine Chapel? You know, like, uh, let, you know, don't waste my time with this, you know, uh, this is really original. You have to use relevant criteria. And that's what the, the term value is about. It's knowing what criteria to apply and what to compare the work to. And judging value in creativity is essential to the process. What it means is that a creative education is one where we teach skills and disciplines. It's one where we enable people to understand the process and it's one that's also intimately connected with the development of critical judgment. And that's really, really at the heart of this. It's not just anything you feel like or anything that you decide to blow off steam about. I mean, that, that may be part of a creative process. But real creativity involves judgment, discipline, and control. And that has implications for the curriculum, for pedagogy, and for assessment. But the real key to it is this, I think, that you can't be creative unless you do something. You can't be creative in the abstract. You have to be doing something to be creative. It could be anything. It could be cooking a meal. It could be making a movie. It could be working on a scientific program. It could be working on a theorem. It could be composing a piece of music, but it has to be something. Being creative is a practical process. It's, so to speak, applied imagination. Now, the application of imagination to me is really an important point to understand. Imagination is what sets us apart from, I believe, the rest of life on Earth. Very little else does, by the way, but this does. But you can be imaginative all day long and never do anything. To be creative, you have to do something. And it's something that has to involve the application of your intelligence. And intelligence is tremendously diverse, highly dynamic, and unique to each of us. So the connection between creativity and intelligence is also at the heart of the larger argument. As human beings, we don't see the world directly, I believe. This is, a, to me, a, a, a fundamental and general point about education. We don't see the world directly often. We see it through frameworks of ideas, through frameworks of values, through belief systems, through um, ideas we've inherited from other people as much as ones that we've forged for ourselves. As human beings, we create our world, we create our life, we create the world that we live in. And when we create things together, when we come to share beliefs, when we come to share values, when we come to influence the way we each think, then we develop culture. Culture is the consequence of our shared process of making meaning. And much of what we believe, we believe in common. We believe it because we've grown up with other people who influence the way we see the world. It's why, by the way, if you want a very day-to-day -day example of it, we end up sharing accents. It would be very unusual for somebody in the middle of Scotland to spontaneously develop an Argentinian accent. Uh, people develop the way they think uh, collectively very often. They influence each other deeply. I don't mean we come up with identical ways of seeing the world, but we, we deeply influence how we see things through the people we share our lives with. Accents, just one example of it, but shared codes of dress, of behavior, of cadences, of rhythms of speech, and so on. When we co-create, we create cultures. And our cultures are equally diverse and dynamic and distinct. It's why All Our Futures is subtitled Creativity, Culture and Education. Because the way we create is deeply affected by the cultures we live in and by the ideas of other people. Uh, creative processes are, if they're not directly collaborative, which they often are, they're deeply influenced by the work of other people, by our knowledge of traditions our knowledge of other people's practices. We seldom create, in fact, it's almost impossible to imagine 
are creating things entirely in a cultural vacuum. So these two terms are deeply and intimately related. Uh, so all this has implications. It has implications for how we run our schools and for the culture of schools themselves. Let me just spell out a couple of them. A proper program of creative and cultural education, which is essential for economic, cultural and personal purposes, requires a broad-based curriculum. It requires a broad-based curriculum because different disciplines speak to different areas of our intelligence. They are important to the economic vitality of our communities and they also speak to different areas of our culture. You see, there are, I say there are misconceptions about creativity, there are many about culture. One is that culture is a synonym for the arts. Well, it, it was at one point. In the 17th and 18th century, that's how people saw the word culture. Uh, it was another way of saying the arts, the fine arts in particular, and literature. But there is a broader conception, which is the one that we used in all our futures, and the one I use, uh, of culture, which is more of a social definition of culture. Uh, culture in the sense of a way of life. We define it this way, that culture means the values and forms of behaviour that characterise different social groups. Now, if you take that broader social definition of culture, of the way people live and act and behave, or as it's often used in business theories, there's a, a shorthand for it, which is that culture means the way we do things around here. But if you see it that way, and, and if you see the complexities of culture as being um, a series of nested subcultures within dominant cultures, then I think it becomes clear that the arts are not separate from culture. They're not the culture of a society. They are ways in which societies work through their culture, ways in which societies evolve and express their culture, that artists, musicians, writers, dancers, poets and the rest aren't on parole from society. They're at the heart of the way social systems evolve and the way cultures and values evolve. They live out, they question, they challenge and they help to shape the values and forms of behaviour that societies manifest in their day-to-day -day cultural activities. So the arts are at the centre of the cultural identity of our communities. And by the way, if you really want to understand the culture of another community, then engage in their art forms, listen to their music, look at their paintings, read their literature, read their poetry, and experience at first hand, if you can, the way their sensibilities are expressed through their art forms. So the arts are not a synonym for culture. They're ways in which the dynamics of culture are shaped. But there's a second misconception about culture, which is even more limiting, which is it's not just the arts as a whole, but certain sorts of, so to speak, high art. Uh, the sorts of um, art forms that are celebrated in our, our particular sorts of institutions. Uh, the, the ones that are thought, as Matthew Arnold once said, to represent the best that's been thought and said. Well, I, I'm not arguing against either the classical tradition in music or uh, the, uh, the so to speak, elite ends of, of the fine arts, or about reading the great canons of literature. But what we do know is, as Raymond Williams once said, that there is a selective tradition. Uh, the arts are restless and dynamic, and many of the, uh, the, the forms of arts practice that we now consider to be high art started out as very popular forms of, of creative and cultural discourse. Shakespeare, for example, was a populist writer. Uh, Often the music that we listen to now in our concert halls started out as program music or has its origins in folk culture. And that Picasso, remember, was deeply influenced in, in his Cubist period by African masks and African art. The roles of the arts in culture are as restless and dynamic as the formation of ideas within a single mind. They're diverse and dynamic and distinct. So a cultural education should not simply focus on what we consider to be, through received wisdom, a canon of high art that we have now come to venerate. A genuine cultural education will engage kids in the restless interrogation of works of art and help them understand how they might play into their own lives now and how current forms of artistic practice may, in due course, uh, become the new canon in the future. A, a cultural education is dynamic, diverse and distinct. So we need a broad curriculum. Uh, one that recognises the multiplicity of intelligences. Uh, we need a curriculum that gives equal weight to the arts, to the sciences, to humanities and to physical education. We need 
effective forms of teaching uh, in creative education uh, because to teach creatively and to teach for creativity requires certain types of pedagogical skill and not all teachers have them and they particularly can be forgiven for not having them given the narrowness of our current pro approaches to teacher training. So getting pedagogy right was a key recommendation of all of our futures and it's one of the reasons why creative partnerships became so important which I'll end on in, in just a minute. But we also need effective forms of assessment. Assessment should be seen as a motivating force in education. It should be seen as a support, it should be seen as a diagnostic process, as well as reporting on achievements that we want to record at the end of a programme of work. And it's vital that what we reward in assessment corresponds to what we want to cultivate and promote in practice. So, for example, I do find it perplexing that the government properly now is arguing for the importance of the arts in schools. Uh, the music review came to that view for music education that there should be an entitlement. Uh, the Henley review on the cultural entitlement I hope will give a proper place not just to the arts but their relationships to the rest of the curriculum. All of this is good. I find it perplexing though therefore that the arts shouldn't be featured in the English Baccalaureate. The assessment system should absolutely encompass and enshrine the values and priorities that we want for the whole of the education system. So if there's to be an education, an English baccalaureate at all, then the art should be four square with the sciences, the humanities, and indeed with physical education. Otherwise, it's simply a mixed message and a destructive one. In America, there's a, a program of legislation called No Child Left Behind, uh, which didn't include formal assessment of the arts and although it promoted the arts, the arts have fallen out of schools across the public sector in, in, in America year after year. So you cannot argue for one thing and then le leave it out of the assessment system. So curriculum, pedagogy and assessment all matter. But the final thing is this, that an effective form of cultural education, of creative education, depends upon effective partnerships. And that's what creative partnerships was set up to do. Uh, it was deeply influenced by the work of the All Our Futures group. It came out of recommendations that we made in that report. I believe the recommendations were misunderstood by the government of the day, by the way, because Creative Partnerships became an Arts Partnerships programme, and it was housed in the Arts Council. I never wanted to see that. I thought that was a mistake. What we had in mind for Creative Partnerships generally was that they would include the arts, but also the business sector, the science sector, technology and broader community groups. It seemed to me, by placing it inside the Arts Council, uh, it, we were creating a long-term problem. And I think uh, that turned out to be true. I think it's one of the reasons why, uh, although it did enormously good work, it was never a completely happy relationship. The Bridge Initiative now is focused just on the arts, and it aims to build on creative partnerships. In doing that, I think it should celebrate the great achievements of creative partnerships. Um, the evidence from Ofsted and the rest that creative partnerships really fulfilled much more than the original expectations for it. But getting the structure right will matter now as we move forward. So I, I do welcome this conference. I'm glad to be able to contribute to it. The challenges that we try to describe in all our futures haven't gone away, they've increased. Um, but the opportunities are still there and I think they're growing. I think there are great opportunities currently in schools to put these principles even deeper into practice. I think the government's relaxation of the requirements of the national curriculum creates opportunities that are much needed. But I think it's important too, as you carry on the conversations during this particular day of the conference and the conversations that I hope will follow from it, that you recognise that the work you're doing isn't just important in England, it's part of a worldwide movement. I speak at events all around the world and everywhere people are trying to get this right. They see the need for radical transformation in education, economically, culturally and personally. You are part of a movement, a movement that's happening now and a movement that's been going on pretty much since the beginning of public education. It's gathering force and I encourage you to be part of it. Uh, one of the great honours I had a while ago was to get the Benjamin Franklin Medal from the Royal Society of Arts and um, I was reading up a lot about Franklin at the time. Benjamin Franklin once said there are three sorts of people in the world, I like threes don't you? Uh, he said that there are those who are immovable, those who are movable, and those who move. 
And you know what he means. Now in education that's true. There are some people who just don't get it. They think the only way to move forward is to move back and try and get back to the way things used to be, and they're immovable. Um, well, I think we'd have to accept that and, and accommodate them as best we can. History is on your side, and it's not on their side, and we'll discover that. Um, but there are people who are movable, people who are open to the argument, who are receptive, and will listen with an open mind, and will become involved if they're persuaded. And we should work hard to persuade them. But then there are people who move, people who see the complexities of the present and who anticipate the challenges of the future. And education has to be front and centre in meeting that challenge. H.G. Wells once said that civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And it is. And there are times when catastrophe seems to be edging out in front. But I'm an optimist and I believe that the will and the creative powers of teachers and of artists and of other professionals and of children will see us through these challenges. But to do that, we have to make some serious challenges to our current modes of practice and join the movement. As Franklin said, there are those who move. And a new direction, and in my experience, those who get involved in this sort of work in schools and who were involved in creative partnerships, and those you here today, are among the people who are moving. And I congratulate you and encourage you to keep moving and move in the right direction.